Okay, so in this lecture, I'm going to introduce you to JavaScript. It's going to play a pretty uh, dominant role in the second half of the autumn term. It will play an extremely dominant role in coursework three if you, if you get uh, on to doing coursework three. So I'm going to start off um, with an introduction to JavaScript. Then I'm going to try and explain as clearly as I can how variables work in JavaScript, because I realize that for some people this can be confusing, so I want to make it as clear and explicit as possible. Next, I'm going to talk about functions in JavaScript, and then while for if else kind of uh, functionality in JavaScript. And then at the end, I'll just give you a little taster of what it means to do some dynamic HTML. All right, so JavaScript um, is a programming language that makes websites dynamic. Um, most often, it runs inside the browser, so you put some script, some JavaScript inside the browser. The browser executes that and it dynamically changes the HTML that you see. Developed by Next, Next, Netscape originally, it's got very little similarity to Java, although it's been claimed that the name was a marketing ploy to capitalize on the popularity of Java. So what kind of stuff can you do with JavaScript? We well, can do like transitions, sort of flashy sort of stuff on the web page, lots of interaction things with the user, animation, so if you, you know, a lot of people wrote games using animation the first year the, cor the course ran. Form validation, so people don't submit empty fields and so on. Slideshows, you know, picture slideshows, whatever. You can dynamically load data from the server using JavaScript. Uh, games, and so on and so forth. It's an incredibly flexible language. I think you can even do robotics with it if you feel so inclined. So a couple of examples of websites of JavaScript. Um, just to sort of whet your appetites. Um, so on the course website, I kind of give you this link to sort of, you know, 21 examples of good JavaScript. Uh, or JavaScript at least, and then you've got stuff like this, so you've got this sort of timeline, history timeline, you can click on different stuff, it has all these kind of fancy animation stuff about, you know, this is like history over time or something, I'm sure it works, but, um, you know, it looks pretty flash, right, that's the main thing, this is all done using JavaScript and probably the canvas, I'm guessing. So have a little look on that uh, website if you want some more examples of flash JavaScript, because these days, if you've got a flash site that does lots of cool things, Almost certainly it's being done with JavaScript. Back in the day, it used to be done with Flash, but you can do everything you need to now with JavaScript. JavaScript's also becoming increasingly popular as a server-side scripting language. Um, in that case, you're using JavaScript instead of PHP and .NET, etc. And Node.js is the execution environment um, that's typically used for server-side JavaScript. So JavaScript's just a script. It has to run somehow, and either it's going to run in the browser or it's going to be executed by Node.js. <coughs> this is going to be covered later in the course, and the coursework three will be based on JavaScript running on Node.js. And as I said, there's many, many applications of JavaScript. Now, so far you've done a fair bit of Java, I imagine. Um, and compiled languages, um, such as Java and C++, um, what happens there is you write, write some text, effectively, and then you have a compiler it converts that text into something that's pretty close to machine code. In Java, it's called bytecode. I think so. I think it's bytecode, something like that. In C++, it's some kind of like machine-specific, architecture-specific machine code. So, it, so the compiler converts the text, the script, um, into executable code, and then that's actually run by the computer or by the virtual machine in case of Java. On the other hand, you have a lot of scripting languages in computer science, um, and JavaScript and PHP are examples of that. And these are executed dynamically um, without being compiled. So instead of converting them into a more machine-friendly format, um, you have an interpreter. That interpreter works its way through the JavaScript and interprets each line of code as it gets there. In the case of JavaScript, there's like a, the browser typically does a double pass. First, it looks for functions, and then it works through the code, executing each piece of code as it goes. So there's no compilation. It's just a scripting language that's dynamically executed. So either execute it till it hits the end or hits an unrecoverable error. So you don't, so with uh, Java, you discover the errors before you run the program because the program won't compile, or at least you discover some of the errors. Um, whereas with JavaScript, um, when it's running, um, it will fall over and die um, if it hits an unrecoverable error. So to run JavaScript, it's very easy. You just add some script tags to your web page, um, or you can include JavaScript as a separate file and link to that separate file by the web page. And modern websites can have enormous amounts of JavaScript, and these are typically included as external files. And again, when you come to coursework three, you're almost certainly going to be including large amounts of JavaScript um, from external files. 
And then the JavaScript's executed when the browser loads the page. So here's your hello world in JavaScript. So standard HTML inside the body. In this case, you've got these script tags. And what these script tags are doing is generating an alert with the message hello world. <coughs> um, so if we're using uh, JavaScript in a separate file instead of the script tags, um, we just use create a file with the extension .js. Um, we and then we have, and then we link to that um, in this way. We have got a script tag. We still need the opening and closing script tag, but in this case, we have a source attribute um, with the value um, that's the location of the file. So in this case, if we store, you know, the alert or whatever. Oh yeah, in this case, we're creating, putting our JavaScript in this myscript.js file. This alert statement here. If we link to that on this page, then we'll get the alert. Now, JavaScript um, has different ways of debugging. Um, different ways of debugging JavaScript. The sort of commonest way is just using the alert, which isn't very good really because it's just displaying a pop-up dialog, which can be annoying. Um, a more, even more crude way is to write to the current page. So if we do document.write, hello world, um, we'll output some actual HTML that's being included in the page. Um, where the browser is in terms of its um, interpretation of the page is where this will be output. The best way to output JavaScript debugging information is in the console. And what I haven't really had time to cover in this course is uh, debugging tools in Chrome. So Chrome will let you step through pieces of JavaScript and view the variables and all this kind of stuff. Um, if, I, if I have time, I'll cover it in one of the later lectures because uh, that's the sort of the optimal way of debugging to actually learn a proper debugger. So console output. Um, so when you do something like console.log, you need to see the output. Now Chrome has these wonderful debugging tools and you can see the console output in Chrome and I'll show you how to do that. You can also view it in NetBeans. NetBeans has like an output window when you're running JavaScript and it'll show you the output from the JavaScript there. Brackets, um, it might be possible to do. I had a quick go at this. Um, it seems that brackets needs an extension to show you the output from the console and um, I couldn't get the extension to install, but you know, maybe you can get that to work. So I've kind of gave up on brackets because I need console logging in my JavaScript. Um, that's why I've gone back to NetBeans, um, but maybe you'll have better luck with that. So these are the different types of debugging outputs. So here we have an alert where we have the message that we're alerting. So here we have like, hello world. Here we have document.write. In this case, it's putting the, um, what, what we're writing straight into the document, which isn't great if it's a public website, obviously. And console.log, best way of doing it. Here is the um, Chrome debugging window. Here's the console. And when we do console.log, it outputs hello world here. I'm getting some weird, ignore this fave icon business. I've never understood what that is. But you can see all the debugging output coming straight through there. So the syntax of JavaScript, um, it's case sensitive. Um, so my name, like written like that, is different from my name, which is different from my name. Variables must start with a letter an underscore or a dollar sign, some PHP legacy there, I imagine. Um, and don't use, obviously, use JavaScript keywords for variable names. You can't call your variable for, um, you're just going to confuse the, the interpreter. Each statement ends with a semicolon, just like Java. So, for example, if coding a variable, um, who's var so coding a variable, we use the var keyword, then we say name equals duke. So we're creating a variable whose name is name, is name and the, ver the contents or value of that variable is duke, and it ends with a semicolon. So I recommend that you use camel case. It's fairly standard for Java and JavaScript, um, and use camel case for naming variables and functions. When it comes to creating kind of objects and classes, maybe it's more appropriate to use a capital letter at the beginning, but in general, camel case with a small, uh, small letter at the beginning uh, is good for variables and functions. So if you want to write my variable, just do it that way, my complicated variable that way. So it's much better than PHP where you've got to do all this stupid underscoring business. You can just use the capital letters here. Comments in JavaScript were the same way as Java, uh, same way as PHP. You just have a single line comment with two slashes at the beginning of it, multiple line comments, you have a slash star and a star slash at the end. As usual, comments you code extensively. Every function should have a comment explaining what the function does. Every um, significant block of code or significant part of the code should have comments explaining what that code does. This will help you to write better JavaScript and you'll get more marks for your project. Right, so in this section, I wanna explain very slowly, very carefully, how variables work in general 
and how variables work in JavaScript. Because uh, I found when I'm teaching Java um, that many people are struggling with what a variable is. Okay, and it's the, one of the most fundamental things you need to know before you do, when you're doing programming. So I want to make sure you're all very clear on that before you do your JavaScript programming, um, because they're handled a little different in JavaScript, and you've really got to be clear about what, how they work. So I'm going to explain in general what variables are and how they work in strongly typed languages such as Java and weak dynamic types, uh, type languages such as JavaScript. So you know, this is a video. You can skip through it if it's boring. Um, but if you don't know it and you don't really understand variables, um, I strongly recommend you watch this piece. So what's a variable? So computers have chips in them, right, um, called dynamic, uh, dynamic memory, ra dynamic random access memory, something like that. And the RAM, the random access memory, contains a large number of memory cells. They're called memory storage cells. It looks a bit like this. You must have probably upgraded your RAM at some point. And each, so there's millions and millions of cells in here, and each of these memory cells can store a 1 or a 0. So when you create a variable in a computer program, you get control over some of these memory storage cells, which can hold ones and zeros, and you gain the ability to read and write ones and noughts to and from these storage cells. So if we looked, you know, far, far, far inside these memory storage cells, what we'd see is kind of just voltages, actually. But these voltages, um, voltage above a th certain threshold is interpreted as one, and a voltage, is and a voltage below a certain threshold is interpreted as a naught. So very roughly, if we had a sort of super mega microscope, when we looked inside this, this uh, uh, RAM, this, inside those memory storage cells, we might see a sequence of numbers like that. A lot of noise, but let's suppose we saw a sequence of numbers like that. Now, when I declare a variable, in, when I'm writing a piece of code, I say in JavaScript, I use the keyword var. So I just say I'm creating a variable, and I'm going to give that variable the name, my number. Okay? And that means that I get control over some of these uh, ones and noughts inside these memory storage cells. Okay? So that's so my num is the name for this sort of set of ones and noughts that I've gained control over by declaring a particular variable in a program. Now, when I assign a number to a, to a variable, um, what happens is this, this number here gets copied into the memory storage cells, right? So I know that I've got control over these memory storage cells storage cells with this variable. And when I do an assignment operator, what's here on the other side of the assignment operator gets copied into the memory storage cells, changing the voltages so that we have a different sequence of ones and noughts in the memory storage cells. When I output a variable, same happens in reverse. What we have, we, you know, I'm saying alert my number. Computer knows that my number you know, is the, the variable that's you know, got control over these memory storage cells. So we do alert my number. It takes those ones and noughts, and it can output it to the user. This is all approximate, but it, it's giving you the right idea, I think. Then we can do mathematical operations on a variable. right? So if I want to add 1 to my, to my variable, um, what the computer will do first is it will take this number here, it will add one to it. At that time, nothing's changed. This is stored in a separate bit of memory. Then when we do the assignment operator, um, the result of that calculation will then be copied back inside um, my variable here, inside the memory storage cells controlled by that variable. Now, this is like done slightly crudely because you know, we never really, we don't often work with ones and noughts in computer science. And these ones and noughts are usually used to represent many different kinds of things, like numbers, letters and words, music, pictures, poetry, whatever you like. Um, so that's what we interpret ones and noughts as when we're looking at you know, playing a computer game, for example. But the programs typically interpret the ones and noughts in a more restricted sense as numbers, strings, or booleans. Now, in a strongly typed language, by strongly typed language, I mean Java or C++, this kind of thing. Uh, the ones and noughts that are linked to the variable are always interpreted in a specific way. So you declare a variable, and you, when you declare a variable, you say, this is a number, this is a string, this is a boolean, and so on. And that's what it means to say that each variable has a specific type, which is declared when you create the variable. So if you want to change the computer's interpretation of the variable, you have to explicitly cast it to interpret the ones and noughts in a different way. So in Java, we might say, integer my number equals one, or string my string equals the cat's out on the map. And in Java, it's, you, know, you have to declare these within the program, and you know, changing them is complicated, and you have to cast them explicitly to interpret my string as an integer. 
In that case, it will do its best to interpret the string of ones and noughts as, a, as just a simple number. Possibly, I'm not even sure that will work. So, so what you can't do in Java is assign uh, my string to my number because they're, two diff they're different types, and so it's incompatible to assign a, some, a variable of one type to a variable of another type. It won't let you do that. The programming language will rule it out. And that's with strongly typed languages. So strongly typed languages, when you declare the variable, the computer is holding a representation of the type of that variable. So when I say my char my char equals a, so then it's going to, my char gains control of some of these memory story cells, and the computer has a record somewhere that this is a char type. And the same here, I've got a byte, my byte equals 97. Again, my byte's getting control of the, over these memory storage cells, and the computer's recording the fact um, behind the scenes, you don't see it explicitly, but it restricts the operations you can do on it. Behind the scenes, it's recording the fact that this is a byte variable. And then when we come to outputting this, that will control what, the, what you actually see as a sort of as a programmer or as a user. So in this case, we've got my char, which is of char type. Now, if I just in Java, if I just do system dot print line my char, um, then it's going to output an A. It's outputting an A here because it knows that it's a char type, so it has to convert this string of ones and noughts into a letter to output it to the user. On the other hand, if we've got a byte, um, and we do system dot print line my byte, because it's a byte type, the computer knows that we need to output a number to the user, not a letter to the user, because of the type of the variable here. Note in this case that both, the, both of the numbers, both of the strings of ones and naught for these two variables are the same, but they produce a different output because they're of a different type. Now that's for strongly typed languages such as Java and C++. In JavaScript, the type of variables is weak and it's dynamic. You don't declare the type when you create a variable. You just use a single keyword var to create a variable saying that this is a new variable I want you to create and I want you to give me control over some ones and noughts in the RAM. What happens is that the browser dynamically figures out what kind of data it is on the fly um, and keeps a record of that behind the scenes. And then because it's dynamic, it means you can change the type at runtime very easily and very flexible very flexibly. Now the types of variables you typically work with in JavaScript are strings, so we might say var x equals cat to create a string variable. Numbers, we can have like a, like a double, that looks roughly like a double. Uh, integer, floating point, or you know, floating point numbers. Um, we can have Boolean variables, and we can have arrays and objects, which I'm going to cover in a lot more detail in a later lecture. So different types of variables, but they're all created with the, variable, with the keyword var, and the behind the scenes, JavaScript, the browser is looking at these and saying, oh, well, that's a double. I'm going, to represent, I'm going to hold that as a double type, or I'm going to hold that as an integer type. So the browser will, will do different operations depending on what type it thinks the variable is, um, but it won't tell you what type it is, and you won't know what type it is unless you explicitly ask the browser to tell you. So, so let's have a little look at what happens here. So let's say we do var my string equals a. So in this case, it's going to create we're going to get control over some memory storage cells, um, and it's going to, behind the scenes, because this is a string, um, the browser's going to keep a record of the fact that this, is a, this variable is of type string. And then my integer is 97. Again, it's going to get control over a certain number of um, ones and noughts, and it's going to be, um, the, the browser will keep a record of the fact that this is an integer type. Within JavaScript, it's super easy to change the variable type at runtime. So if I add an integer to a string, um, the browser will convert this integer variable into a string variable type. So if I do my int plus my int plus percentage or whatever, it's going to, behind the scenes, change this to a string type because I've added an integer to a string and the result of that has got to be a string, right? Unless, unless this was a number, then it might be a more complicated interpretation. In this case, it's a simple string, so it's just going to convert the type of my int into a string type. And there'll be a set of very specific rules um, that control how the variable should type or change. Now, JavaScript interprets um, instructions from left to right, and this control and this determines. Um, this means that different sequences of operations will result in different uh, final results. So. Does different sequences of operations produce different results? That's what I'm trying to say here. So here, we're, we're, again, we've just got a var x being assigned to a string being added to a number. 
but we go left to right. So the JavaScript in this case will start with Volvo, a string, and add it to 16. The result will be Volvo 16. In this case, it'll start left to right, so it'll start with 16. It'll say, well, that's an integer. Another integer, I'm going to add the two together. That gives me 20. 20 plus Volvo gives me 20 Volvos. So 20, we can add strings with a plus sign in JavaScript, by the way. On the other hand, if we go left on this one, we're starting with a string, adding 16 to it, so that's going to give me Volvo 16. Then we're adding four. This is already a string now, so we're adding a string to another to an integer, which will result in another string. So we've got what, Volvo 164 as opposed to 20 Volvo because we're interpreting this left to right, and these have different orderings left to right. You can also have a type undefined, and that's a variable that has uh, no value or it hasn't been initialized, so it's just undefined. JavaScript hasn't figured out what type it is because it hasn't been given a value, and it uses the value to assign the type, so it's just type undefined in this case. Now, if you, if you want to dig down into how JavaScript's, how the browser's interpreting the variables, um, you can use this type of operator that returns the type of variable. So here we've got variable my number, and if we log the type of my number, we first get undefined because it hasn't been assigned to anything. Then we assign it to seven, and type of, in this case, we'll say, well, this is a number because I'm interpreting this as a number variable. If we add it to a string, the type will then become a string, so number plus a string is a string. And then if we do... What are we doing? Uh, oh, yeah, in this case, it's an object. We're creating a more complex object. Going to cover that in a later lecture. And then we do type of my num. It then becomes an object type. So you can see the type's changing after each operation. We can find out how it's changing if we use this type of. All right, well, I'll give you a little demo. So I'm going to use NetBeans here. Um, but you can use Java. You can use, you know, whatever you like, really, to create this stuff. So here we have our HTML file. And here we have the script tags. And so we're going to write some JavaScript in the script tags here. So we do var, I know, my var equals uh, three. And then we can do console log uh, my var is. And then to add strings, you just do plus my var. So much more beautiful than PHP. OK, so save that. And Within NetBeans, um, this is the built-in browser, the WebKit's browser here, um, which if we had anything in the page, we'd actually see. You see that's the title of the page there, and that's the title of the page here. So this is the built-in browser. We don't really need that here, because what we're using here is the output, and the output's um, what, this is what's coming out of the JavaScript itself. So this is why I'm using um, NetBeans. I can easily show you, um, we can write some script here and save it, and then the page will be refreshed, and then the console.log stuff will all appear here. So I can easily show you what's being output by the JavaScript. I can show you the same thing in uh, Chrome. Probably a good idea to get rid of that. So in Chrome, I've got the same page open. These are debugging tools. And if you look here, we've got the console at the top. Now, if we refresh the page, um, we're seeing exactly the same output from the JavaScript and saying my var is three, so you can see. And if we got really fancy, um, we could probably figure out the... Um, is it like, there's some very cool debugging tools in Chrome, but I can't, I can't bother to find them now. Okay, so that's creating variables, and then type of will just tell me what type the variable is, right? So we can also do, you know, console.log. Uh, my var is type. And then just do type of uh, my var. Okay, save that. You can see my variable is type number, and if I put uh, added it to a string, blah blah, blah. Uh, it's saying my type now. Is, so the the variables changed to that, and the types changed to string. And if I didn't assign it to anything, it would be undefined. So in JavaScript, um, it's not that fussy about quotation marks. You can create strings with single or double quotation marks, which is handy because sometimes you want to put single quotation marks inside double quotation marks or the other way around. But when you're working with JavaScript, be very careful not to paste in quotation marks from Word or PowerPoint or a similar program. Word and PowerPoint have fancy stuff in them that makes the quotation marks look smart, so they kind of enclose um, the thing they're quoting. And, but these are, these are sort of funny characters that aren't, really, aren't recognized by JavaScript or other programming languages. 
So, you know, for coding a string, we can use double or single quotation marks. We can have, like, we can use single quotation marks inside double quotation marks, as in this third example. We can also use double inside single quotation marks, very flexible. But what we can't do is use these, these are, word, these are quotation marks pasted in from Word or PowerPoint. And in that case, you can see it's not highlighting it correctly, and this won't run in JavaScript. So be, be careful about that, particularly if you're copying stuff off my lecture slides. Right, functions. So in JavaScript, um, we can wrap up blocks of code in a function, just like any other programming language, and you'll be using functions a lot in JavaScript. And in a later talk on advanced uh, JavaScript, I'll explain all the amazing things you can do with functions, um, but you have to wait for that. Right, so we, so we wrap up the block of code in a function, we call the function to execute the code, and we can pass parameters to the function. Functions can return data, just like any standard programming language. So here's a little example. Um, here we've got a function uh, called say word. Don't know if we got, yeah. Um, here's an argument to the function. Um, so we, when we call say word, cat is copied into this uh, variable here. So when we do document write, this is the word, it outputs cat. If we're passing, calling it with cat. On the other hand, if we call say word with dog, it'll pass dog into there, and when we do, and then it'll do, this is the word, yeah, there we go, this is the word dog. So keyword function, the usual curly braces, name of the function, and uh, any arguments you want to pass to the function. These arguments don't have to have types um, because JavaScript doesn't have types. So we can pass strings, numbers, booleans, etc., to a function. We can pass in variables as arguments. And when we pass a variable as an argument, um, its value of the argument, the value of the, the value of the variable is copied into the, its corresponding parameter. And each parameter, yeah. So each argument that's passed to the function is copied into a parameter with, that, with the name of that argument. Um, and each each of these parameters acts as a variable within the function. So let's, let's um, try and make this a bit more clear. So in this case, we're passing a string to the function. So this string is copied into here. So the, the variable word now um, contains cat. And word now becomes a variable within the scope of this function here. So we can use word here, to, and we can just output it like that. Now, this is to do with uh, scope. I'm going to give you a detailed example about this. Um, so when we pass a variable into a function, um, we're just copying that variable into the argument. So, um, so if we change the argument or the change the parameter's value within the function, it's only going to affect the parameter, not the original variable passed to the function. So this, this is the principle to bear in mind. If you keep this rule in mind, whatever happens in the function stays in the function. This applies to numbers, strings, booleans, um, not to objects and arrays. So that, we're going to come to those later. So this is a little example that might make what I'm trying to say clear. So here we have a, a function called increase number, and we have a, an argument passed in here. Uh, we're passing in, passing in uh, this is a variable called number, which is the argument to this function. So within the function, we're increasing this, this a number obviously becomes a acts as a variable within the scope of the function, so we can like, add one to the number. So that's, what, that's all this function is doing, is it's adding one to the number, adding one to this, and outputting it before and after we've added a number to it. So here we are, so within the main, so that's the function. In the main part of the code, we're declaring my number and setting it equal to 10, and then we're going to call this function to increase the number, and we're going to see what happens before and after calling this function. So the first part of it, we create the number, and we output the value of the number. And here's the output. It says the number is 10. Then we call the function um, to increase the number. So the first thing it does is it writes out number. So whatever's been passed in here, it writes it out. And in this case, it says the original number is 10. Then it increases the number by 1. And then it outputs the value of the number. And it says the increase number is 11. And finally, at the end of it, we say we output... Uh, the value of this variable now, and in this case, it still says the number's 10. So that's the point of this example, okay? So even though we've called increase number and passed my number to here, what happened is that the value that my number had when we called the function was copied into this variable, this variable was increased, but this one remained unchanged, okay? This one remained unchanged. And therefore, um, the number remains 10, even though we've called a passed it to a function that increased it. But because it's not increasing it, it's increasing a copy of it. Functions can also return data. 
um, and you can return call return at any time to exit the function, just like Java. Again, JavaScript doesn't have uh, explicit types, so you don't have to specify the type of the return data. You can just, you have a function that adds numbers, so it takes these two numbers, creates a new number that's the sum of the, these two numbers, and returns the new number. So we can say var x equals add numbers, and then we can output the result of that calculation. Now, another thing, sorry to overload you with all this stuff, but you really need to be as clear about all this as possible, is the difference between global and local variables. So global variables um, are declared outside any function and exist, and their scope, or where you can use them, is anywhere on the page. Um, you can access them anywhere in your JavaScript code, and they live along as the page. Whereas local variables are declared inside a function, and they disappear when the function ends. And this is and where a variable exists, and where you can access that variable is known as its scope. So sc scope is the, the key word to, to get here. All right, so let's... Um, so here we've got a, a global variable called pass threshold that we can access anywhere in our code. Um, and then we've got a function here with, it, what's got, with a local variable, um, average grade. And this, this function here can um, access pass threshold here because it's been declared outside the function and anyone can access it. Whereas average grade can only be accessed within the function because we declared it with var average grade um, within the function. If you forget to use var, your variable will immediately become global in scope. And that's going to lead to some nasty programming errors if you're not careful. So in this case, um, I've declared var average grade. I've used var to declare, to declare average grade. And that means that average grade does not exist anywhere outside of this function. So if I do alert average grade from outside the function, I'm going to get uncaught reference error, error average grade's not defined. And by the way, um, the debugging tools in Chrome are a great way to see errors in JavaScript. You know, you just run your code in there and you can immediately see errors and it's, it's a very good way of debugging it. But anyway, so in this case, I'm using var, which means this the scope of this variable is limited to the function, therefore JavaScript can't find it when I invoke it outside the function. If I forget to use var and I call alert average grade, then I can get the value of average grade. It immediately becomes a global variable, which means lots of trouble. It means that this variable can be mixed up with all kinds of other variables. Um, it can get very confusing. I might use average grade in another function. It's just going to be a mess. So just be really careful to use var when you declare variables, otherwise they immediately become very global in scope. Okay, so I'm going to go through fairly quickly through some of the standard um, programming, uh, programming features of JavaScript, standard syntax of the language. So we have conditionals, um, an expression that evaluates to true or false, use that for branching and so on and so forth. Um, so you can check to see whether a variable is less than 14 or greater than or equal to or equal to or not equal to. So that's, for example, animal not equal to bear is true if the variable animal does not contain the string bear. Now, one thing to be aware of um, that's fairly unique to JavaScript uh, is the difference between a double equals and a triple equals. So JavaScript has a dynamic type, as I've explained, and with double equals, um, JavaScript will do its best um, to, to match the two things a bit that are being compared um, without worrying about, the t without trying to match the type as well. So it might see if a string can be interpreted as a number when it's comparing them with double equals, um, or a string can be interpreted as a Boolean, maybe. I haven't tried that. On the other hand, um, we've got uh, triple equals. JavaScript will compare both the type of the two things being compared and the value of the two things being compared. So this is much stricter than that. And in general, you should use the triple equals rather than the double equals um, because, you know, in general, you should be comparing things that are the same type unless you, you know, being fast and loose. So let's just get a little example here. So here you have var age equals two. So this is of integer type. So if we say compare age to two with a double equals, then that's true, right? We're comparing an integer here and an integer here. So that's all fine. But with JavaScript, behind the scenes, it can be very flexible and dynamic or whatever. So if we compare age to a string two with a double equals, JavaScript will look inside the string, see if it can find the number two, and if it can, then it'll, evaluate, it'll, it'll return true. So in this case, this will also evaluate to true. Third example, we're using triple equals now. Um, we're comparing integer two with an integer variable, 
Um, in this case, it values to true with strict type matching. But the fourth example here, we've got three equals. Um, in this case, this will evaluate to false because the type of age is different from the type here. And so JavaScript's going to compare the type and say, this is an integer, this is a string, wrong, different types, um, they're not equal because it's using the triple equals here. We've also got logical operators, so A, you know, A double slash B is true if either A or B are true, and true if both A and B are true, not A, true if A is false. So A and B can be Booleans or expressions that evaluate to Booleans. So we can say A is greater than 7 or B is less than or equal to 9, for example. So a couple of examples. Um, we've got var1 equals true, var2 equals false. So if we output var1 or var2, so one of them is true. So in this case, var1 is true, so that's going to be true, right? And then we do these just breaks, and we do and comparison. We do var1 and var2. They're not both true, so that's going to be false. And if we do not var2, var2 is false, so not true, var2 is true. So just like PHP has explained in the previous lecture, um, we have uh, while and for. There's also for each in JavaScript, which I'm not going to cover here. Um, so the while loop, we um, have uh, we execute this bit of code within the curly braces of the while loop for as long as the conditional in the while loop is true. So in this case, we're initializing the variable sweets to five, and we're going to keep doing this for as long as sweets is greater than naught. What we're going to do is writing eating a sweet, eating a sweet. Each iteration of the loop, we're going to write eating a sweet, and then we're going to decrease the sweets variable here. So with a while loop, be very careful that you're somehow going to make this conditional false at some point. Because otherwise, it's going to go forever, and your browser's going to hang, and eventually ask you if you want to stop, uh, stop the script executing. Because it's just going to keep doing this, keep doing this, and never stop. So you need to make sure something in the while loop is going to break it out of the while loop eventually. For loop um, avoids that problem. Useful for executing code a fixed number of times or for working through an array or something like that. You have the initialization part where you create a variable i and set it to naught, for example. Conditional test um, to check um, whether the for loop should continue. And an increment, um, which will increment a counter. So, you know, this, this can be more flexible than you might think, but in general, this is the right way to do it. You just have for loop here. We're creating a variable i equals naught. Make sure you use var or i is going to become global. We're going to make sure, execute the for loop for as long as i is less than 10. And then we're going to increase i for each, each time the loop we go through the loop. So it's going to output hello from for loop i is with the value of four, with the value of i 10 times. Um, and, you know, if you want to make it, you know, you can make this reverse this condition and decrease i or something like that. You can fiddle around with it in all kinds of ways. But as a standard way of out outputting stuff, it's pretty good. So if else, you must have come across in other programming languages. But just to briefly summarize, so we can do multiple checks of diff whether conditions are true. So we've got var number equals 7. If number equals 4, we do one thing. Other else, if numbers equals 5, we do something else. Or else, we do something else. So this is a standard way in which we can work through a number of different conditions and do different things depending on those conditions. If you've got um, multiple lines of code after an if, um, then you need to use curly braces. Otherwise, um, you're going to get errors. It'll just execute this line of code and then do some other weird stuff or produce some kind of error. So if you want to do two, two things after your if statement and before the else statement, um, you must use these curly braces. All right, that's a little, little demo before we go into dynamic HTML. OK, so, so let's just do a just do while loop. Uh, while my var is greater than naught, let's, you know, um, console.log my var of the loop, OK. Oh, yeah, I need to decrease it, right? So my var minus minus. So that's a standard while loop. I've got a condition. Um, I'm just outputting, in this case, the number, right? So it's going to output here. You can see we've got 3, 2, 1, 0. Very easy. For loop, sort of similar, right? Uh, for var i equals 0, i is less than 10. 
uh, I plus plus, let's get rid of that. And console.log I, and we don't need that anymore. So save that, and you can see it's doing 0, 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10. Um, and we can do, you know, conditionals here. If I, uh, so this is like a, I forgot what it's called. So let's see if, if I is divisible by 2, uh, I slash 2 equals 0. Then we're going to output I. Uh, see if that works. So in this case, yeah, we're doing 0, 2, 4, I think it's the modulus, isn't it? 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, so it's outputting even numbers, and we can probably do not equals here, and in case that's outputting the odd numbers. Um, so let's just say even, and then we can do an else, console.log, Odd. So this is a classic of else, right? If if i is a, if the remainder after we um, divide i by two is not naught, then it's actually that's odd, right? Let's make it let's make it equals. So if there's no remainder when you divide it by two, then it outputs even. Otherwise, it outputs odd. So I think that gives you a rough. You know, this is fairly easy stuff, and I hope you've covered it in other courses anyway. But just to just to refresh you. Right, so now we can go on to the final, most exciting part uh, of JavaScript. I can give you a little bit of taste of dynamic HTML. So, this is the easiest way to change a web page. You're going to do it in lots of different ways over the course of the year, but this is just a little taster of you know, how we can use JavaScript to dynamically change the page. So what we're going to do is going to give an HTML element an ID. Then there's this very handy JavaScript function called document get element by ID, which returns a reference to that piece of the HTML, to the HTML element that has that ID. And then we can use the inner HTML property of that element um, to change the HTML dynamically. So here's a little example. Um, standard page with a bit of JavaScript here. So talk, covered IDs a lot, right? We get a paragraph. It's got the ID attribute set to my ID. And the current text in that paragraph is dog. Then I do var my paragraph equals document get element ID my ID. So this my ID is the ID of this paragraph, and this returns a reference um, to this piece of HTML. So now my variable is kind of pointing to that piece of HTML, and the HTML elements have a property called inner HTML, which can be used to set um, everything that's inside the, the HTML tags. So in this case, I'm, ch I'm setting that property inner HTML to be equal to cat. So when this is run, um, we should see cat um, instead of dog. So initially, um, this is set to dog. When the JavaScript runs, um, it changes that from, cat, from dog to cat. So I'm dynamically changing the HTML um, by attaining a reference to the paragraph. Easy peasy. Now I'm going to show you a slightly more you know, exciting example. Um, I'm going to use a, uh, an interval timer for this. So this I'm going to explain a bit more when we come to animation in JavaScript, but for the moment I'm just going to explain it as something to use. There's a function in JavaScript called setInterval, and what setInterval does is it will execute this function um, every um, at an interval specified by the, the milliseconds here. So if we set um, this to 1,000, it would execute this function every second, because a, 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 a second is 1,000 milliseconds. So it's a built-in method that executes the specified function repeatedly after the specified interview millis interval, interval of milliseconds. So yeah, for example, we've got a function called my function, and a thousand specified, we want to execute that every thousand milliseconds, it will execute my function every second. So now we can you know, do a full dynamic web counter. So again, we've got a paragraph with an ID, my ID. We've got a JavaScript variable called counter, which we initially set to naught. And then we've got the paragraph, we're getting a reference um, to this paragraph here, using document get element by ID, as I just explained. Then we've got a function that will take this variable and increase it by one, and then it will change the contents of this paragraph um, to, re to reflect the value of the counter. And then all we're going to do is call set interval, and we're going to say that this method should be called every thousand milliseconds. So every thousand milliseconds, it's going to call this function, it's going to increase the counter by one, 
and change the paragraph. So what we're going to see is it's going to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on and so forth. And we can quickly write that now um, as part of the demo. Right, so let's uh, start from scratch. So within our body, we're going to have a paragraph with ID, my, my ID, doesn't matter what it's called, obviously. Um, well, we'll set the counter to naught initially. So there's our paragraph. Now, first thing we want to do is do var counter equals naught, and we'll have var para equals document get elements by ID. And as I'll cover later, there's many ways in which we can obtain. Um, just check something. Obtain references to elements. Um, yeah. just never remember it. Yeah, small d. Sorry, right. couldn't remember small d. All right, okay. Uh, my ID. Great. So we've got a reference to the paragraph. Now we've got a function. Uh, increase counter. Doesn't have any arguments. And all this is going to do is do counter equals counter plus one. And then we're going to do para dot, see it's nice text completion with NetBeans, para in HTML equals counter. Okay. And then we do set interval uh, increase counter. Uh, that's the name of the function. And we're going to do uh, 1,000 milliseconds. Okay. So it's just going to be like a little clock we're going to create in our browser. So let's just see if that works. I don't know if it'll work. Oh, there we go, right. So this is the built-in WebKits browser. So if you set up the WebKits browser, you can see the browser, NetBeans' own sort of simplified browser within the NetBeans development environment. And so every second, JavaScript's increasing the counter by one and changing the value of that counter inside the paragraph um, in the web page. So there we go. We've managed to change our web page dynamically uh, after only, you know, 47 minutes of JavaScript. Okay, let's just get out of here. Right, so the course book is called, is something like Head First HTML5 Programming. Okay, that's the one of the, the book you sort of get standard with this module. Um, but, uh, if you're learning JavaScript, um, you might well want to take a look at this book. It doesn't cover some of the more fancy things of HTML5 programming, like um, local storage or geolocation or any of this kind of stuff. But what it does do is give you a very solid grounding in JavaScript, going all the way from the simplest stuff I've covered in this lecture, all the way up to you know objects and prototypes and all the rest of it, which I'm going to cover later in this course. So it's a cracking book. Um, you can view it uh, for free as much as you want. You can view the electronic version for free as much as you want through the Middlesex Library Catalog. And chapters one to three, you know, a good start for um, understanding the material I've covered in this lecture. And if you want to learn how to program JavaScript, um, you could do a lot worse um, than working your way through this, through this book systematically, trying out all the examples, trying out the exercises. And by the end of it, if you've actually done it properly, you'll be really good at JavaScript. So, I strongly recommend um, you give this book a go if you want to get good enough to write a good game and get a good mark for your project. I haven't looked at this book, um, but since I love John Duckett's other book on HTML and CSS so much, I'm guessing that this is pretty good too, but that's only a guess. So you might also want to have a little look at this one if you prefer his more kind of designer-oriented approach. So this lecture, I've introduced you to JavaScript. Now, JavaScript is going to play a big role in this course. It's going to play a big role because it's such a dom it's, you know, it's so important for writing a modern web website from a client point of view, and it's also becoming increasingly important from the server point of view um, with the execution on Node.js. So you can't be a web developer without JavaScript, and that's why I'm emphasizing JavaScript in this course. That's why you've now got, um, in the second half of the autumn term, you know, most of the lectures are going to be on different aspects of JavaScript, so that you've got enough to be able to write a good game in JavaScript. Um, so JavaScript's used to create dynamic interactive web pages. As I've explained, it's also run on the server. And the next lecture, I'm going to talk about JavaScript arrays and objects, 
um, which is going to play an important role when you're talking in your coursework one, because you're going to be storing your data in JSON format, which is essentially a JavaScript object, a, a string version of a JavaScript object, as, as I'll explain.